The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the second chapter of John's Gospel. John chapter 2, I'll be reading verses 1 through 11 there. John chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, reading on to verse 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour is not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone jar, water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you've kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Now, O oh God, may we have ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts open to receive, hands and feet willing to go wherever you call us to go. As we listen now, Holy Spirit, speak. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, Chuck was taking his usual six-mile walk, which is crazy, by the way. I'm just saying that as somebody who, you know, in a day may not walk six. But anyway, taking his usual six-mile walk one morning in downtown San Diego when he saw something that was a bit unusual. He was so struck by what he saw that he did what well, just about all of us do these days when we see something unusual, when we're walking or anywhere. He reached into his pocket, he pulled out his phone, and he snapped a picture. He showed several of his friends the picture that he had taken, and they all said the same thing. We see it too. We see the same thing you see. We all see it. What Chuck saw was a steam-fogged window on one of the floors of the Hard Rock Hotel, and in that steamed fog was an image of Jesus. Now, while others have seen different things from that random, probably the window washer's random swiping of his hands and the steam from a shower inside, Chuck and his friends were convinced it's Jesus. Now, some 2,300 miles away from San Diego and Chuck's six-mile walk in Spartanburg, South Carolina, there's a small little storefront congregation called Care Baptist Church. And they see Jesus every time they gather for worship. But not the way you might think. There in the sanctuary, there's no stained glass, no art. It's a very simple place. You've been, probably been in a church like this. Preacher stands at a podium, and then there are two doors. One, one may be going to the bathroom. One may be going to the Sunday school rooms or something like that. But there in the sanctuary, to the left of the pulpit, so my right, is a door. A door like most others, except that when the, the factory put the door together, the wood grain, the parishioners swear looks just like Jesus with his hands folded in prayer. Now, depending on who you ask and probably where they sit in the congregation, some say, oh, he is surrounded by his flowing regal robes. Some say, no, it's clouds. He's surrounded by clouds because he's in heaven, you know. 
Others, maybe more classical rock, classic rock inspired, say, no, there's definitely a stairway to heaven behind him. But Steve, one of the members there, says, no, no, that's Jesus. And he took Jesus' image on this door as a sign. And so he called the local paper and told them, God wanted me to get the word out so people would come and see it. And if people came to see the door, well, you know, they might, they might stay and find God while they're here. Chuck and Steve are not unique when it comes to seeing holy images in strange places. People see them all over the world. They do, and everything from a grilled tortilla to a stale Cheetos. I knew a youth minister one time, he kept one in a little glass case on his shelf. I said, what is that? He goes, oh, it looks like Jesus on the cross. It's a Cheeto. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, in 2004, uh, this online casino placed a winning bid for what was then a 10-year-old, so now a 25-year, I want you to sit that this thing in for just a minute, a 25-year-old grilled cheese sandwich because it looked as if the image of Mary had been grilled into the surface of the sandwich. Now, it's 25 years old now. In 2004, they paid $28,000 for that sandwich. Now, all this begs the question to me, with people seeing Jesus in foggy windows, in tortillas, grilled cheese sandwiches, Cheetos, doors, whatever, it all begs the question to me, why is Jesus and Mary, why are they always popping up in these unusual places? Why are people always seeing them there when, man, we are are rich with images of them in stained glass, in pictures. On the, you go to any doctor's office, there's a little Bible story thing sitting right there on the edge of the table. There's Jesus everywhere. But still, we look for him and we find Jesus in these odd places. It may seem silly, but to someone, I think, who is listening for a word from God, seeking direction in life, or simply wanting some affirmation of something out there greater than him or herself, an apparent appearing of Christ's face in something as mundane as a mustard stain can be a sign, a revelation of something greater. And who among us hasn't at some point in our lives searched for a sign from God? In the first century, people were looking for signs, too. Just a couple of Sundays ago was a Sunday we call Epiphany. It's when we mark the arrival of the Magi. Those fellows were looking for a sign. They were looking up. Maybe they were astrologers looking in the stars, looking for a sign. We don't really know. Maybe it was a comet. Maybe there was a star in the right place in one of the right astrological signs. But they were looking for a sign, something signaling the birth of the king of the Jews. But others were searching for signs too, and they were looking for them everywhere, even in the scriptures, in places like Joel chapter 3 or Amos chapter 9 that, that speak about this coming day of the Lord when there would be such an abundance that the mountains would drip with sweet wine and the hills would flow with wine and milk. And of course, there were, well, it was that ever-present feeling that I think permeates all of human history. That feeling that something big is just around the corner. This is why every election is the most important election. Even more important than the last one. This is why every televangelist can make hay and tell you the end is coming in my lifetime. There's always something sort of permeating our existence that something is about to happen, something unknown, something out there. It's why people were able to make such a hysteric, uh, massive deal about the Mayan calendar predicting the end of the world. Because we're always looking for something, some sign. And so were the people of the first century, looking, waiting for a sign from God to begin to signal the beginning of something new, a new age. Some of the rabbis called it a messianic age, the age of the Messiah. 
And in this atmosphere of anticipation, people didn't just sit around on their hands looking for signs. No, they went about their business doing life, still ever so often looking for something. Babies were born, parents died, and then people got married. There were weddings. And that's where we find ourselves today, at this wedding in Cana. Now, the first two verses of John's second chapter say, On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his friends had also been invited. Now, this isn't, this isn't what you might think of as a wedding. A wedding in first century Cana was not some, some uh, mid-afternoon sort of thing with flowers and cake and dancing off-site, because, you know, you can't really dance at church, uh, uh, and punch, that kind of stuff. No. A wedding in Cana would last at least a week with people coming and going, plenty of food to feed a small army, wine flowed freely, and there were even separate spaces for the bride and her party and the bridegroom and his party. People would go to sleep. I mean, it lasted for, it was a party. Needless to say, a wedding in Cana was a party to which you hope you got an invitation. And this particular wedding in Cana may have been the wedding of a relative of Jesus and his mother, who was never, by the way, named in John's Gospel, which I think is interesting. But Jesus and his newly gathered group of disciples were invited out of custom. Well, if Mary's coming, Mary's my cousin, we might as well invite her boy and his friends too. Now, one of the things that most every wedding seems to have in common is the fact that something is going to go wrong. I've done enough weddings. I've only been a part of one, or well, only been in one, and then been in the bride in the bridal party. What I'm saying is I've only been married once. Maybe I should clarify that. <laughs> Sally's getting a little worried. But I have been and done a lot of weddings and been to a lot of weddings. Someone trips going down the aisle. My friend John's wedding, a snake slithered across the aisle. <coughs> They're still together, so it wasn't a bad omen, I guess. Somebody forgets something. Somebody spills the barbecue sauce off the little cocktail weenies down the front of their rented tuxedo shirt. Something happens. Preacher forgets the words, calls them the wrong name. Somebody falls over. Something's going to go wrong. Whether it's an issue with the weather, a sick groomsman, a photographer who forgot to pack the right lens, something is bound to disrupt the flow of this this hoped-for perfection. But this particular wedding in Cana, It was a wine shortage. Verse 3, we hear the panic news, right? When the wine gave out, I love that, by the way, it gave out. (laughs) Yeah, it was given out, I'm sure. The mother of Jesus said to him, to Jesus, they have no wine. Now, this may sound sort of trivial, almost as if she nudged him, they ain't got any wine, Jesus. But this would have been a very bad thing, a great social faux pas, since the host of the wedding, who is most likely a relative of Mary's, was supposed to make sure that every guest had plenty to eat and plenty to drink. And since Mary's, this was her relative, she certainly didn't want to bring shame to her kinfolk. This is a a, a culture of honor and shame. And so she turns to her eldest son, Perhaps one now that she, she's a widow, but, but perhaps one who, you know, she's starting to realize, oh, this is the Son of God. She turns to Jesus and says, they have no wine. And what does Jesus say to her? Woman? You've probably heard me say this before. Do you know what the Greek word for woman is? Gune. Isn't that lovely? Mary says to Jesus, they have no wine. Gune? (laughs) Woman? What concern is that to you and to me? Now, John's a very theatric gospel, so I imagine that's how it went. Woman? Gune? What concern is this to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. Maybe Mary thought Jesus would say, all right, boys, uh, Peter, go down, go down to, the, to the grocery store and, and save the wedding. Just pick up some, I don't know what it's called, some wine, some red. It doesn't matter. These folks are half-wasted anyway. Just get something off the shelf and bring it. Maybe. Maybe she just wanted to let him know 
so that he and his disciples would, maybe y'all cut back a little bit, maybe get some of the lemonade, you know, they run out of wine. I don't know. Either way, Jesus doesn't seem to think that the wine shortage is worth his worrying. But Mary, Mary has a mother's intuition. And so she says, she says words to the servants in verse 5, I think we could all hear. I'm talking about Jesus. Do whatever he tells you. That carries some weight, doesn't it? Do whatever Jesus tells you. Now, in the middle of this ordinary cultural event, there is this ordinary, perhaps expected problem. And despite the initial protest, Jesus takes action to remedy the problem before it has a chance to get out there, before folks start murmuring, they run out of wine. They run, oh my goodness, can you believe it? They run out of wine. So Jesus says to the servants in verse 7, fill the jars with water. These large stone jars for ritual purification. You know, this is the day before water is really actually clean enough to wash anything off your hands. And so they would have these stone jars, 20 or 30 gallons full, to wash their hands in sort of a ritualistic sense. And so they filled them to the top, to the very top, between all six jars, about 120 to 180 gallons. And then he said to them in verse 8, Draw some out and take to the chief steward, the one who has taken it easy a little bit on the wine, the one who is in charge of making, every, making sure everything goes fine. So he hasn't gotten so far gone that he won't recognize, or that he will, re, he will recognize the taste of good wine. But now the gospel writer doesn't tell us how Jesus did it. There's no mention of any word spoken. He doesn't lay his hands on the jar. He doesn't say bippity boppity boop, nothing like that. There's no prayer offered. They just dip water out of the jars. They draw out a bit, and upon taking it to the chief steward, we all find out that, in fact, the water has been turned into wine. And not just any wine, but the best wine. In fact, the steward says so. He says, he called the bridegroom and everyone to him. Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you've kept the good wine until now. There's something about that, I suppose. Jesus isn't going to make mediocre wine out of water. But here it is. He gave credit to the bridegroom, the steward did, and maybe his caterer. But in fact, no one aside from the servants, John tells us, knew what had happened. But verse 11 says that Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. John tells us who it was, not the bridegroom, not the caterer. It was Jesus. Jesus did it. He turned the water from the ceremonial jars into the best wine at the banquet. Now, that's a miracle. John calls it a sign. That's what John calls all of Jesus' miracles in the fourth gospel. He never uses the word miracle. He says sign. Isn't that interesting? People were watching, waiting, and hoping for a sign. A sign from God. Some indication that maybe the age of the Messiah was close at hand. Some signal that the day of the Lord might be near. And then Jesus does this. His first of his signs at a wedding in Cana. Where only a few servants know what happened. And only the few disciples he's gathered so far Believe in him. Now, isn't that strange? The first sign signaling the Messiah's arrival, the presence of God's kingdom, happens in this all too common event of a first century Jewish wedding. The sky doesn't split open, the earth doesn't shake, the sun isn't blotted out in darkness, there's no earthquake, not even the appearance of a divine image in a grilled cheese sandwich. The first sign happens in a surprisingly reserved and quiet way. And only if you come away believing in the one who made it happen. But isn't that how God works? We shout to the heavens in the midst of life's deepest grief for God to give us a sign, something to prove we're not alone, only to hear a deafeningly silent response. 
Then, when we least expect it, when no one else is paying attention, maybe when we're half paying attention, God gives us a sign. It could be something that happens in the midst of the ordinary rhythms of life. A divine wink that tells us we're not alone. A whisper on the wind that brings us comfort when we least expect it, but when we most need it. God may not give us a sign when we want it. But if we're really listening, really tuning our hearts and our ears to the Spirit's presence among us, we just might catch it. A subtle sign from God. Because God speaks to us in the midst of the ordinary rhythms of life. Christ shows himself to us as we go about our lives and those events that mark the passing of time. Whether it's the birth of a child, a wedding, the death of a loved one. Yet too often we are looking for some earth-shattering proof of God's divine presence. We demand signs that prove unequivocally that God is real and hears us when we call. We want the mountains running with wine and milk. But we hear this story instead of a Messiah at a wedding. We don't even know whose wedding it is. And he takes a little bit of water and turns it into wine so that the party can go on. May we hear this story of the wedding in Cana the story of the wedding wine, of turning water to wine, and see that Christ reveals Himself to us even in the midst of the regular rhythms of life. May those of you who are looking for a sign from God see it even now, in this place, in the regular rhythms of worship. May Christ reveal Himself to you in the midst of the gathered people of God. And may we all be attentive to how God gives us signs even in the most mundane places. Even in places we don't expect. Even in places that we have to reflect and say, wait, that's where God was all along. May we be attentive to the presence of God and the signs of Christ's presence in our lives. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Lord, you turned water into wine at a wedding, a subtle sign for those who were there, a sign of this new age, this new life you have come to bring. Help us, Lord, in the subtle signs in our lives to bear witness to that truth. Help us, God, to see the signs you place before us in subtle ways, most unexpected ways. Help us, Lord, to recognize that it is you. Holy Spirit, will you move here now in our presence revealing to those of us who need it, even now, a sign. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.